Order, please. Uh, I'd like to call the Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Economic Development to order here today. Um, my name is uh, Keith Irving, MLA for King South, and I am the Vice Chair of this committee. Uh, and today we are meeting to hear from the Halifax Port Authority regarding the future of the Port of Halifax. A uh, reminder to everyone in the chamber here to T -t today to turn off your phones or put them to vibrate so that we don't interrupt proceedings. Uh, in case of emergency, please exit through the back door down the hill to Hollis Street and we'll meet at the courtyard of the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. And again, with uh, COVID protocols, we ask everyone to uh, wear their masks during the meeting unless they are speaking. And uh, we continue to try to enforce a bit of a one-way flow through the chamber, so we will enter through those doors and exit over the wings here to my left and right. Um, and uh, please try not to uh, leave your seating during the meeting. So to achieve that, I'm going to ask if it's uh, acceptable to the committee members that we take a break after one hour at the appointed hour of 2 o'clock, 15-minute uh, break, and then extend the meeting to 3.15. Is everybody in agreement? Great. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to uh, ask my colleagues on the committee to introduce themselves, and perhaps we'll start with uh, Ms. Roberts. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Lisa Roberts, CMLA for Halifax Needham. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, MLA uh, Pat Dunn, uh, Picto Centre. I'm Ben Jessam. I represent Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Brendan McGuire, Halifax Atlantic. Good, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Rafa DiCostanzo, the MLA for Clayton Park West. Good afternoon. Bill Horn, MLA for Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank. Good afternoon. Tori Rushton, MLA for Cumberland South. Good afternoon. I'm Claudia Chender, MLA for Dartmouth South. Welcome. Uh, great. Well, thank you. Well, I'm going to turn it over uh, to our witnesses today, Captain Alan Gray, President and CEO, and Mr. Tom Thomas Hayes, Chair of the Board of Directors, to make some opening remarks. Following that, we'll move into questions, and I'll ask the members to uh, indicate uh, if they would like to ask a question by raising their hand, and we'll do one question and one supplementary, and hopefully we'll, we can get all nine members of the committee an opportunity to uh, ask questions. If we're running out of time, we may have to forego the, uh, the supplementaries. Uh, so I'd like to now turn it over to Mr. Thomas Hayes, Chair of the Board of Directors. Mr. Hayes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I would like to say thank you uh, to your committee for inviting us uh, here today. Uh, Captain Gray and myself are pleased uh, to be able to share with you more information about the positive uh, developments happening at the Port of Halifax. As the provincial nominee to the board of the Halifax Port Authority, I also have the privilege uh, to serve as the current chair of the board as well. Uh, we were initially scheduled uh, to appear before the committee, I think back in April, but COVID-19 made that impossible. But I think in many ways, uh, we, have, we have a better sense, better, uh, better visibility than we did then uh, on how the pandemic will affect our business going forward. Uh, it's also my pleasure to, uh, to introduce to you Captain Alan Gray, our President and CEO of the Port Authority, who joined us uh, last November from his duties uh, at Fremantle Port in Australia. Uh, it's been an interesting year, to say the least, uh, for Alan. He, he arrived here in November, and shortly thereafter, uh, CN had a rail strike. And then early in the new year, uh, he had to deal with the rail blockades. Uh, following that, we had the announcement uh, of, the, uh, of Northern Pulp and how that impacted uh, the port. Uh, and then, of course, we had the pandemic arrive and shortly thereafter, uh, the cancellation of the uh, cruise season. Uh, and then the most recent, uh, I guess it was a challenge and an opportunity, was the Montreal uh, port strike. Um, so uh, he has said to me on a number of times, a number of occasions, he said, you didn't tell me about any of these tests during the interview process. But he's, he's weathered it well, and, uh, and I'm sure he's uh, happy to be here with you today, and uh, he's going to make some opening remarks after the introduction by the chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hayes. Uh, Captain Gray, welcome, and 
please tell us uh, about your exciting year. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, it's been a whirlwind since November. Uh, coming from 32 degrees in Australia to winter in Halifax was the first of the opening. But 2020 has been a, a challenging year for the Port Authority, as it has been for many people um, with the COVID environment. But all in all, we originally thought our cargo volumes would drop about 20%. Uh, in the end, it looks like we'll probably only drop about 10% over the year. So that's uh, it's a good improvement. Part of that's the lift in our quarter three with um, reopening of some of the major manufacturing areas, um, which is increasing trade. And of course, the Montreal diversion lifted some of our cargo. Um, at the same time, we're continuing to support the larger ships. So Port of Halifax has always had its brand as the ultra-class you know, port in Atlantic. Uh, and uh, we're seeing the 15,000 plus vessels turning up to the port at this stage. Um, but not only that, series, the other terminal uh, up above the bridges there at Fairview has also had record size vessels at 8,600 TEU. So both terminals are working at optimum level. Um, fortunately, we came into 2020 with a good financial position from 2019. So that's helped us weather the storm. But we've had good expenditure control over the year and some diversified revenue, which has also assisted uh, in getting a good financial position for this year. Uh, the diverted cargo is virtually clear now. We're current again. Um, that put continual strain on uh, our dwell times, um, but that cargo has cleared and we're back to normal dwell times, um, which the port is quite proud of. The South End Container Terminal expansion, uh, the extension of the pier line to 800 metres, uh, was officially opened last Friday with the first vessel um, going on to uh, use that service. And we also saw the arrival of the post Panamax crane or super post Panamax crane from PSA, which is a great investment by them, which allows us to continue to operate for these ultra class vessels. Cruise has been the biggest challenge. Uh, we came into cruise from the previous year with a record year and 179 vessel calls. Um, we were expecting over 200 vessel calls this year uh, and we've had zero. Um, so it's a significant impact. And whilst it's an impact on the port, we're obviously aware of the, the broader impact on the economy for Nova Scotia and Atlantic Canada. And we're doing what we can to work with partners in, in trying to get that return of cruise. Fundamental to that is what's happening in Europe and the Mediterranean with a slow resumption of cruise. And there's a, a lot of testing going on and seeing how that will work. Um, there's some concerns around the US and US-based passengers. Um, we're still waiting to see how that pans out. But critical to us succeeding will be where Canada sits from a Transport Canada and public health position, um, but also the fact that both the provincial governments and the federal government are going to need to be aligned in their positions with the return of crews, um, and that'll be a critical part for us. As far as uh, a question, I believe, is uh, what's the new direction with the new CEO in the port? One of my key platforms has been a one-port city. Um, it's important for me that the Port of Halifax is seen as a Port City Halifax and not the Port of Halifax and the City of Halifax. Um, so I've set out to get greater collaboration with various stakeholder partners with the city and the province in seeking to make sure that the, what the port does is sustainable into the future and that we can work together to get improved decision making. Uh, and that started out with uh, working with the government on setting up a collaborative transport forum where we could talk about some of the work that we're doing. The collaborative decision making platform we're working on is an APEC software platform to allow stakeholders to come together and share their um, planning processes and what they're doing and allow us to visualise to stakeholders improved decision making as we go forward. So it's a key platform for us as we move forward. And from a community point of view, uh, I established the Port Liaison um, Committee. So that was an outreach to community people that aren't normally touched by the umbrella of the port. So there's lots of port users that are normally come under our stakeholder umbrella. Uh, this was about getting a diverse opinion and insight as to the impacts of the port's operation on the community. Uh, quite often these are set up mainly around projects, but this is about the port's day-to-day -day operations. You, would have may, you may have seen that uh, we signed a contract with Saab um, for a new port management information system. 
Um, this forms the foundation of our digital platform going forward and our roadmap for digital and innovation. Uh, so it, it's significant. Current infrastructure projects, uh, you'll be aware that we were provided funding to find a solution to the trucks that are moving through downtown. Uh, planning is almost complete on that, so the year has been spent with our partners ensuring that we've got an appropriate plan that everyone can sign on to for the construction. And we will commence work on the Fairview truck gate and some of the road realignment um, down at the south end uh, early next year, uh, moving on to the rail layout um, in the following years after that. But already some of that road traffic has been reduced by other initiatives that we've done with CN and PSA in the meantime. The other is a marine container examination facility, um, which is for the um, Canadian Border Force um, to do their examination of containers. Currently that's done uh, away from the port environment um, and we're bringing that into the Fairview area so that we can get more efficient processing of containers for um, Border Force. So they're the main infrastructure projects that are currently on way. Um, we're also into detailed master planning, bringing together the work that had been done in the port previously into one single master plan. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, thank you, Captain Gray. Uh, so we'll move uh, to questions now from committee members. And Mr McGuire, you're first up. Um, thank you for being here today. Um, I guess we know who to blame for 2020 now. It's all been uh, terrible since you moved here to Canada, so we'll, we'll just blame you for everything. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I just was wondering, uh, with, with the cruise ships, for example, uh, it was a big, uh, big industry uh, for tourism and our, our local uh, restaurant owners and, and tourism industry. Uh, obviously, you know, for anyone that uh, uh, has had their eyes open, the, uh, the um, there's ter ter terrible impact on our local economy. You know, downtown Halifax on a sunny day. Uh, I mean, I remember uh, this summer taking the kids down here and there was a place to park which is usually rare. Uh, so uh, what, what, what kind of impact has this had on our cruise industry and how do we bounce back? I'm assuming it's a negative one, but how do we bounce back and what's the plan to bounce back from that? Uh, Captain Gray. Thank you for the question. Um, for the port itself, the loss of cruise obviously has a bottom line impact, but the, the impact is greater to the small operators and, um, and we're seeing that a lot of operators are either going out of business or uh, struggling to survive through. Uh, there's a lot of nervousness about the return of crews um, and part of that is it, it's twofold. One is a community nervousness about bringing crews into their community but also from the cruise lines it's about having a safe destination to go to. One of the fortunate things I think we have in Atlantic Canada is we have an appealing destination, we have a friendly destination and a, and a safe destination which has been shown with the low numbers of COVID events. So from a, from a point of view that uh, Cruise wants to come back, that, that's there. When they do come back, it's going to be around how can they control the movement of passengers off the vessel. So um, the, the experiences we're seeing at the moment through Europe and Asia and Italy is that it's restricted tour operations, so it's not free walking off the vessel. So we won't have passengers that will just walk down. So in the early stages of the return of cruise, I don't think you'll see the same busy waterfront environment um, because you won't have the passengers just wandering along the waterfront. It'll be very controlled. Um, cruise ships will be at about 60% capacity on numbers. So again, we won't, whilst we'll probably see similar number of vessels and size of vessels, we'll see less people coming off those. So um, the return for, for the people that are in the industry will be slow. Um, we don't expect that next year we'll see an instant return. It'll be a slow return and it'll take two to three years before we believe it'll get back to the numbers that we saw in 2019. Mr McGuire, a supplementary? Yep. It's, uh just a quick uh, question on another topic. Uh, you touched on it in your opening statement about Friday's announcement. Um, can you go into a little bit of detail on the announcement and uh, the impact this is going to have on our ports and our local communities? Captain Gray. Um, the extension is significant in future proofing for the port um, into, into 
remaining Australia's ultra-class gateway. Um, the ultra-class vessels are 366 metres uh, in length, so to be able to successfully handle two of those, we need that 800 metres of key line and we need the deep water. Um, so we're the only Atlantic port that can handle that, that size vessel. So ensuring that that extension was done so that we can handle vessels efficiently and reliably uh, was critical for us. And so that, that announcement of saying that was finally finished was a confidence boost to the shipping community to say, you know, the port's there for the long haul, uh, it's able to service our vessels successfully, um, and it's a safe destination for them to come as a supply chain route. Um, the important thing now is that gives about 800,000 TEU capacity along the key line. Uh, work being done now with um, PSA and CN is about lifting the capacity of the rail and the terminal layout to equal the, the berth capacity. So um, that work is, is in the planning stages and, and will go along. So it's a, it's a significant uh, confidence boost for the industry. Uh, Mr Dunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, welcome to Nova Scotia. And I'm sure your colleague hasn't mentioned to you that uh, the next year is going to be even rougher than this year. So, <laughs> hang in there. Just, uh, <clears throat> just want to uh, mention a couple things with Northern Pulp, okay, with regard to the uh, the port. I mean, f fundamentally, Nova Scotia is uh, a resource-based economy, and uh, we see through the data that uh, over a billion dollars worth of seafood, for example, and I believe uh, forestry products were number two um, at, at the port. On, unfortunately, uh, late last fall, um, the present government uh, made an announcement that sent some negative ripples across the province from one end to the other uh, with the closure of uh, Northern Pulp. The, um, and at the time, I believe Northern Pulp manufactured 280,000 tons of, uh, of this craft pulp, which uh, I think it related to somewhere in the vicinity of between 12 and 13 percent uh, uh, going through the port for, for export. So my, my question is, how, how much has the closure of Northern Pulp contributed to the overall decline in exports uh, leaving here? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Northern Pulp was about 4% of our export market, so, um, so it, was, it was one of our largest customers for the port as a single customer. So um, we knew that this year was 4% uh, down on budget before we, we started. Um, um, we re we've recovered some of that, um, but it had a certain impact at the start. Supplementary, Mr Dunn. Yeah, just a quick supplementary. Um, is there anything that uh, you're presently working towards uh, in the near future to uh, to make up for that decline, Mr. Gray or Captain Gray? Yeah, for the port, it's um, it's about keeping capacity there for exporters and importers, um, less so than us creating the market. Um, but we are working with the forestry market um, in looking at alternative ways of getting product to. To market for them, so uh, you know, is there is there other ways of treating it, shipping it, um, that they can do? So we're working closely with them to see if there's other methodologies or other markets out there that that we can get them access to. Um, for example, we're we're looking at um, trying to get a service through to India or from India. Now, whether that directly relates to their market, it's an opportunity. It's it, and that's our role is to open up those markets. Uh, we'll move now to Ms. Roberts. Thank you. Um, we have a number of questions for you today, but I want to um, ensure that I have time to get to a, a question that's related to my constituency, um, which is Halifax Needham. And, and Halifax Needham includes uh, the historic site of Africville as well as the homes of, of many descendants of Africville uh, today. And, and a number of constituents have raised concerns about the significant infilling and alteration of Fairview Cove immediately adjacent uh, to Africville and to the Africville Museum. Um, so I, I'm wondering if you can please share uh, the extent of the infilling to date and, and what we're looking at, like what is the extent of this alteration um, going to be in, into the future as well? Captain Gray? 
Thank you. Uh, so since I've arrived, I've been working with the Afrifull Heritage Trust uh, and discussing the land and the future uses of the land. So the, the land infill, which um, is a result of putting pyritic slate down and, and burying it subsea, um, is about 50% of the approved area. So that doesn't mean it has to be fully filled. It's just the approved area that we have at the moment. Um, the, the use isn't there for, or all of it isn't for our industrial use. So uh, a portion of it is for the marine, marine container examination facility. So there'll be some of that land, uh, existing land that's already filled in um, which will be used for that. And the balance of it, uh, we don't require for industrial purposes. So we've been working with HRM and the Africa Full Heritage Trust about the future uses that are consistent with the existing uses for Seaview Park and the, the Heritage Trust area there. So um, we're working with them collaboratively to say what the end design will look like and, and how it can be used to, to assist them as opposed to being used for industrial purposes. Ms Roberts? Thank you, and I, I appreciate you know that those conversations are ongoing. Um, at the same time, you know the most recent constituent who contacted me about this uh, described the infilling site at this moment as an eyesore, and it is very close. Um, it's it's sort of directly in your view when you're on the front porch of the Africville Church. Um, and, and so I, you know, appreciating that you're relatively newly arrived in Nova Scotia, I'm wondering if you can uh, shed any light on how, uh, how Africville Descendants and the Africville um, Heritage Trust was consulted about the infilling, you know, before it began and what consideration is being given to restitution or compensation for the impact on what is a national historic site. Just Captain Gray. Uh, I'm, I'm unable to answer before I arrived at exactly what um, was said, but I'm aware that there was consultation and I've seen evidence of meetings um, with that, but as to the specifics, um, I can't answer that. Um, I, we, we have been working closely with the Africa Field Heritage Trust since I've arrived and we've discussed the uses of it. Uh, they're comfortable with the plan use, that the, the height not going to go above and block out views that it's uh, it'll be we've discussed with our board that the use will be for uh, the heritage trust in in whatever form it can be um, best used for them in the sense of parklands or interpretation or that sort of thing um, it's it's an eyesore at the moment i suppose because it's just rock um, capped rocked it hasn't been capped with uh, soil or grass seeding or anything like that so it's in its development phase um, and they're aware of that. The concern of the Heritage Trust was primarily around that of whether there was going to be anything built on that site and therefore block out views. Uh, when I explained that that's not the intent and that we would work with them in the future use, um, they've been comfortable to continue to work with us in, on that basis. Um, I'm aware that the African Field Heritage Trust is, wants to use the, the bay-like area for some purposes. They've talked about getting uh, tour boats to be able to access there. So we're making sure that any design work and uh, infill work is, is compatible with those uses. So um, I can say well, with me here now, um, there's lots of collaboration with the Heritage Trust in trying to make sure that the end use is compatible for them. Uh, next over to Mr. Horn. Yes. Good afternoon. Glad you're here. Um, the Port of Halifax is very important, of course, as you know, for Nova Scotians and Canada. Uh, are there your, some of your suppliers or even CN um, trying to do some developments that would even take more uh, uh, product off with your ultra-large vessels? Captain Gray? Thank you. Yeah, uh, the port with its partners, CN and PSA, we're constantly in uh, conversations with various shipping lines, existing shipping lines and, and the new ones uh, that, are, that we don't have here yet, um, to try and open up new services and get new cargo through. What's important for Nova Scotia, if you looked at uh, the volume of cargo that's specifically Nova Scotia, it's a small volume, it's about 40% of what we move through the port. and. Um, 
to ensure that we can give the best export markets and import markets for the Nova Scotia region, uh, we need to be able to get direct services. And we currently have 18 direct services. And we do that by reaching out to the hinterland, so the Midwest, inland Canada, US cargoes, and facilitating those so that we open more direct routes so that Nova Scotian exporters and importers can find new routes and new markets. So that's critical for us. The outreach of PSA and CN significantly helps us with that. Um, so they, they're working, PSA is a global partner. Um, they have a very long outreach um, to, in the shipping line and in, and in their trade partners. Um, so we're able to talk to more partners in the, in the global sphere to see if we can bring new direct services. And as I said, one of those we're trying to get is an India service in here. So, but to do that, we do that by facilitating uh, the, the US cargoes and the, the, the hinterland cargoes. Um, otherwise, we would be back to a small port um, just dealing with Nova Scotian only cargo. So. Mr. Horn, a supplementary? A quick one, I guess. Is the really uh, what is the Port Authority's uh, let's see, uh, main functions in the Port of Halifax? Captain Gray. Yeah, thank you. Um, our role really is to ensure the efficient movement of cargo uh, and shipping in the port and to make sure that we coordinate partners to facilitate trade and provide economic benefit to the community. Um, so that doesn't mean we have to do every single function. Um, it means we have to make sure the functions are properly provided. And we do that by a, a, a combination of private and, and, and public sector partnerships through the way. So our terminals we lease and therefore we have private partners operating that. We have private operators in the Atlantic um, towage operation. Um, but there's other areas of the operation where we have a, a greater play in what's going on. So it's about coordinating and facilitating uh, and ensuring that we market the port um, the best we can, um, highlighting the benefits that we have in the port with our port partners. Let's move now to Ms. Di Costanzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a couple of quick questions. One of them is um, I remember clearly that uh, I used to be a distributor for a product that I brought from Spain, and my product had to come to Halifax, be shipped to Montreal, dismantled there, then it shipped. So it was a, almost a week extra for my product to arrive back to Halifax. Is this still happening, or uh, is the demand? Um, was that because the port wasn't able uh, to, to meet the demand? Why did it go to Montreal? And, and now that we had the, the strike in Montreal, are we getting a lot of our Halifax products dismantled here first? Captain, so, okay. Captain Gray. It's, it's an interesting scenario. Um, I'd suspect it has something to do with the distribution centre and a value add. Um, you see quite often in some countries where uh, there's a requirement for a value add to be done to the product somewhere. Um, and perhaps those distribution centres didn't exist directly in Halifax. Um, what would be key was to look at how could we encourage the distribution outlet to move from Montreal to, to Halifax. That would be the key. So the port's got the capacity to pass it through. We have the capacity to deliver it direct to customer. Um, but if the primary distribution point is from Montreal, um, I'd say we were fortunate to win that it went through here, but <laughs> it's a long-winded supply chain is what I'd say. So um, I think from an from a economic point of view and, and, and an opportunity point of view is, is how do we encourage dis distributors to operate out of Nova Scotia, you know, your Amazons and people like that, what would encourage them to come here? Uh, we're aware that organisations like that do look at the airport system and the, the seaport systems um, on how reliable they are, but also how far are they into the innovation and digital strategies that, that um, complement what Amazon and, and companies like Amazon are doing. So um, you have a, a good uh, cost of living and lifestyle in Nova Scotia, so you know, getting uh, people to come here from an employment prospect is good. Um, you just may need to be looking at how do we incentivise companies to shift their distribution centres here. 
Mr. Costanzo, do you have a supplementary? Sure, but it's totally different. Uh, I was also thinking about COVID. How did the COVID um, operation affected your operation, and uh, have you learned something from it that will last for after COVID? Captain Gray. Yeah, thank you. Um, COVID had an impact like everyone, and probably more so to the point that uh, there was an expectation from uh, government and community that the port continued to operate. So where some companies, fortunately or unfortunately, you know, had to um, shut down because of the nature of operations, uh, we were asked to continue and continue the, with the supply chain, keep it operating. So we had to work with our partners to find ways for us to continue to operate in a COVID environment um, when people were quite nervous about what the impacts were going to be. Uh, fortunately, in the nature of stevedoring, um, our labour works in individual trucks, um, so we're, they're not always, not like the old days where they're on top of each other. So it came down to cleaning regimes and uh, screening processes. So uh, a lot of confidence building was necessary um, across the supply chain. Um, but uh, it, it was successfully done and, and thankful to a labour force in Halifax, which is uh, forward thinking. Um, I think uh, we're very fortunate to have a labour force here that uh, understands the need for growth and the importance of the port. So they worked collaboratively with their partners and the employers to, to achieve that. Biggest learning is the need to speed up our digital path. Um, is keeping track of critical cargo. Now, one of the things we did was open up a fast lane um, to get COVID uh, equipment through quicker, but a lot of that was done by manual screening. Um, so we, we need to move faster. And we just signed and were successful in um, a bid to do an innovation project which cleans up uh, manifest data so we can identify um, these sorts of cargoes easier. Um, and you would have seen Montreal has also um, brought out a new AI program which identifies COVID cargoes um, it, it quicker. So the digital path is something, is something we need to move quicker on. So. We'll move now to Ms. Gender. Thank you. Um, thank you for these answers. We, this is sort of a lot of it more in the federal realm, so we don't hear about it as much here. Uh, but I think I'll leapfrog off my colleague and sort of pay attention to the port as, a, as an outsized corporate presence here in HRM. Um, and as an urban councillor, I guess, um, I wanted to ask a little bit about port as landlord, which you are in big and small. <laughs> and so I guess to start with, um, I know the seaport market has struggled somewhat and um, I think there was an announcement to develop an urban market hall to make that a more permanent uh, situation. I also know that there was some kind of call for proposals for a group that might manage the market. But what, and I, so I'd like to hear what, if anything, has happened. And I also specifically am interested, I had heard from a number of vendors that in fact they weren't able to access any of the tenant relief that some other uh, organizations were able to avail themselves of during the pandemic. And I know many of the permanent uh, vendors have closed there. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Captain Gray. Yeah, thank you. The the RFP that went out or expression of interest to run an urban market um, didn't return a successful um, proponent. Uh, in the end, there was uh, two, two proponents that went through and one that we had a lengthier discussion with, um, but it, it, it wasn't successful. Um, COVID is a certain play in that, but also the view of most of the market that we talked to was that um, Halifax at this time is not at its level to support that style of urban market. Um, it doesn't have the foot traffic that, say, of Montreal or Toronto, where they're putting them right in the city centre, um, and they get a lot of, you know, um, office block foot traffic past them all the time. Um, we're not quite at that that maturity, and perhaps the seaport market's a little bit further away to be able to achieve that foot traffic. Um, so we continue to work with looking for the right solution um, and COVID obviously is, has made it difficult this year for the farmers market where for a while there we had to close completely until we could find ways to open with reduced capacity or outdoors. 
Um, a learning certainly is that the outdoor component of it was extremely successful and a lot of feedback from um, the public was how much more they enjoyed wandering around the outdoor market uh, and experiencing that. So that was an excellent learning factor for us. As far as the relief, at one stage um, the port had been told that we weren't eligible for any of the um, relief comp um, components from the federal government. So the ports were excluded from that. Um, mainly because the initial component of the relief relied on you owning or having a mortgage over the land um, and the ports own their, their land or it's gazetted to them. So um, that was later changed through um, a lobbying from the Canadian Ports Association to say, well, look, you want to assist these people, but we can't do that if, if you're restricting us in this way. Um, so there are a number of tenant, tenants that have got relief um, down there, but the, the, the seaport market vendors who are the tabletops weren't eligible in that sense. So the ones that had um, true leases with us have, have applied. Uh, I think four of them were successful in, in getting relief. Um, so so we, once we were able to, we applied and some got it, but some couldn't. So. Uh, Obviously, we didn't charge fees to the farmers market proponents when we couldn't open. Um, so, um, and we've got a reduced value at the moment. So. Ms. Chensner, uh, supplementary. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, and yeah, I certainly hope that through some creative collaborations, you know, that that market is able to continue. I guess my second question is about NASCAD. And the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design has kind of a funny history down there, but down there it is nonetheless on a long lease with poor, poor uh, conditions for them. <laughs> but they signed it, I suppose. Uh, but I guess my question is, is there any conversation about the future of that port campus uh, that you could disclose to us? Um, you know, just in terms of thinking about the future viability of the whole site, because obviously it does feel right now like the seaport market is a bit tenuous. So that's a, you know, big piece of, of publicly enjoyed and available land. And the other big anchor tenant, of course, is the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. Captain Gray? Yeah, I haven't had uh, any conversations for any change for NASCAD, although, um, They've requested a meeting soon, but that, there's been no disclosure as to what that meeting's about. Um, but they are on a long, a long lease there. Um, we are looking at the whole area and the seaport district and, and what we can do with it to keep it activated. Uh, it's important for us to keep it as a public access environment, so the, the port's not seeking to uh, turn it over to industrial or anything else. It, it's an important... Um, what I would call a buffer zone for us between what's operational and what's community in the waterfront. So a transition area of land. So what uses we have in there have to be consistent knowing that there's operational components with the cruising and that sort of thing. Um, but it needs to be transitional to the waterfront. So we work closely with um, uh, uh, Discover Nova, Nova Scotia, uh, Develop Nova Scotia, sorry, um, to to look at what, what things we can do in the seaport that are compatible and encourage people to move all the way along. Um, one of the things we're also working with them in is a project for urban planning, um, with a bit like a hackathon, to look at how do we get connectivity between the waterfront and uh, uh, Point Pleasant Park. So how do we get, with an operational area in the middle, how do we get continuity uh, of connection? And uh, I can say that the work we're doing with the rail solution for, for removing trucks, uh, we're looking at overpasses so that coming down that uh, um, lower water road, uh, marginal road I should say, that um, we can overpass the, the primary rail areas and people can get access to the park without disruption. So we're constantly looking in our planning process as to how we can do that better and make it sustainable and engage with the community so that there's still public use and, and port related use. So. Um, we're actively looking at solutions for this, the farmers market. We know it's successful on a weekend. Um, we think maybe you know, we were beating against a, a tree a little bit trying to make it seven days when maybe that's not what it's really about. And uh, let's focus on how to make it really good on the weekends and promote it as a weekend market 
and look at what we can do for the rest of the week. Mr. Hayes, did you want to add something? Uh, thank you. I just wanted to add to um, what Alan said from a governance perspective. Uh, the Seaport District is very important, and uh, we've created a separate committee at the board to, to deal with a variety of options that uh, the, our management team is presenting to us. We were disappointed, as Alan referenced, in terms of the response we got to the RFP, but frankly, some of the ideas that are floating around now, I think, are even more interesting than, say, where we were about a year ago. So stay tuned, but I'm, I'm very optimistic that that will remain a very vibrant part of, of the uh, community. And of course, with the return to cruise, uh, that's also uh, important to us. Mr. Jessam. Thank you kindly, Mr. Chair. Uh, perhaps not your specific wheelhouse, but I, I'm curious in, in hearing you talk about the, the conversations with, I guess, the province and the city related to uh, the truck traffic getting where it needs to go. What, if any, presence of dialogue related to public transit has been included as part of that overall uh, planning, uh, I, I'm thinking commuter rail specifically, but it, it, like, has there been any type of injection in, uh, of that element to the planning procedure uh, through your experiences so far? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Uh, C Captain Gray, and he was referring to your wheelhouse, so I'll let you answer. Um, yeah, it's with regard to um, the rail solution, which is to remove trucks off the road, it's been um, aimed at a shuttle-type arrangement through the cut. Um, there's been no discussion in that about transit rail and, and where that is. Um, if that were to come about, we would have to work that in with the rail paths to see how that could function effectively. Um, what I can, uh, I guess, assure you is that where we're going with this uh, collaborative transport forum is to bring those sorts of things that are uh, perhaps on the cards or in the, in the, in the back lots, is to bring them forward and say, well, OK, if we're going to go down this path at the moment, are these things there and can we take them into account? Can we do something now that would improve the outcome of what we're doing? Or can we make sure that we don't have an ongoing uh, consequence in the future by making a, a solution now that uh, is incorrect. So um, we spent a lot of time in the rail solution and some people are saying, you know, when's it going to happen, when's it going to happen? But I wanted to make sure that um, what we put in there is sustainable and workable. Um, it has to be not only successful from an operational point of view, but it has to be commercially wise. Otherwise, we put too many dollars on the, on the bottom line again of the supply chain and there's a cost and people start to move away. Um, and we think we've done that successfully at looking at how it can be sustained. One of those things is looking at, well, OK, we've taken trucks off the road, um, but we're going to run more trains. Uh, is that an emissions problem? You know, so we're saying we've talked to CN and we know that the size of the shuttle is such that we can run an electric locomotive instead of a, a diesel locomotive. So not only will the solution remove trucks off the road, our long-term sustainability plan says we can reduce emissions as a result and have a quieter service as well. Um, but directly to the transit, it hasn't come into question at this stage. Supplementary, Mr. Jessam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, with your permission, an unrelated supplementary. Um, Captain, you've, you've, you've come to join us from a, another part of the world, which is uh, kind of a wonderful thing, a little... Sorry about the winners in advance, but um, the question that I had for you was re related to your relationship with the newly, well, relatively newly constructed Cove facility. Uh, I know that the port is a, a partner uh, intimately to what extent I don't know, but uh, you know, I'm just kind of curious if you could give us some background on that relationship and, and how that type of a facility helps you know, encourage you to do what you need to do. Captain Gray? Thank you. Um, well, I suppose the relationship strengthened a little bit because I've recently been appointed to their board at, at Cove. So um, 
and that, that <laughs> that's, that's only new in September. So um, uh, for us, Cove um, um, being a centre of uh, oceans uh, entrepreneurship and ventures, it's the fact that um, from a from a tech point of view, is there's a lot of innovation in that coming along, which may have a direct implication on what the port's doing. But in broader terms, the port has its own innovation strategy and framework to go on to and leveraging off what is a very solid oceans cluster here of um, technology and innovation um, gives us the opportunity to be a leader and a living lab effectively for a lot of these innovators and startups. So I don't see it so much as uh, the incubators, but we probably be where the people that are putting the challenge statement out there to say, this is a supply chain problem or here's a maritime situation problem, uh, is there people within the, the larger ecosystem that can solve it? And our close relationship with Cove uh, is a direct support for that. Um, and we're hoping to do more in partnership with them as we move forward and, and hopefully there'll be some announcements about that later. But um, the key is not only Cove, but uh, Deep Sense from Dalhousie and uh, Volta and others, we, we work with them all to make sure we can get access to the latest innovators, uh, young people. For me also, it's these sorts of things are an opportunity for talent development. So using our internal staff on projects like this give us a chance to develop new talent, um, but also it's an ability for us to observe new talent out there uh, and uh, one of our strategies around diversity and inclusion is seeking to do more in that innovation space um, with um, diverse um, communities and groups so that we can encourage more people in Nova Scotia to take up that mantle of the industry, understanding that perhaps some of the uh, questions around the higher resource type jobs are, are disappearing. So how do we keep our young people here um, and by being a living lab for some of this work, that should encourage more kids into that environment. Mr. Hayes? Yeah, again, I, I just wanted to add to uh, what he said. When we had a recent board meeting and uh, we had a, um, a really interesting conversation about some of the uh, initiatives that he wants to introduce around innovation related to marine transportation. I've spent half my life in the venture capital business and there are other members of the board who are very supportive of CDL and, and other, uh, other organizations that uh, are wanting to add to the the, the great you know developments that have taken place over the last 10 years um, in in particularly in Halifax but but beyond throughout the province so again we're very supportive in seeing a, a role for the port authority in that area in addition to our more traditional areas of business uh, thank you let's uh, move back to Ms. Roberts thank you um in your um, annual sustainability report released this year, it explains that the Halifax Port Authority in 2017 set a greenhouse gas uh, reduction target of 10% over 10 years, so uh, average of 1% per year. Um, but it also shows that your carbon dioxide emissions actually increased from 2018 until 2019. So I, I'm wondering if you can speak just broadly speaking, about how you're uh, how you're tackling those those goals, and what explains uh, the direction that things moved in 2018, 2019, and what you anticipate for 2020. Captain Gray. Yeah, um, some some of that increase will be as a result of increase in, in shipping movements. Um, so we had a, an increase there. Um, how we're trying to tackle that in, in is looking at incentivising the shipping industry to have reduced emissions. So we, we did bring um, shore power in for crews, um, so that, um, but not all cruise ships are using shore power at the moment. So some of them are set up to deal with that, but not all of them are at this point. So it's encouraging them over. Um, but we have very good partners at CMA, CGM. Uh, you, you may have seen that they've got their first LNG powered container vessel um, moving around the world and that's a prototype in the container side, and how do we incentivise those lines to to come to Halifax and use alternate fuels? Um, how do we facilitate in Halifax that LNG bunkering is an availability? 
Uh, again, I've just signed with a, a support for a uh, supercluster um, proposal to look at uh, hydrogen fuel cell production here and looking at how we can move um, our, not so much my equipment, but the terminal equipment over to hydrogen or alternate diesel. So we're trying to work with partners and shipping lines to say, how do we as a group reduce our emissions um, in the city, which uh, not only reduces overall emissions, but also looks at um, uh, reducing particulate matter and noise at the same time. So it's it's about how do we incentivise those people that are coming to the port and utilise We can do things in our leases for terminals, so we can encourage the terminal players to do stuff. Ms Roberts? Thank you. Um, I appreciate that the goals, or as I read it, um, I understand your goals to be, um, you know, related to the Port of Halifax activities, which are, you know, on onshore or, or while, um, I guess, while ships are, are tied up. Um, but of course, you know, you're part of a, of a global industry um, that relies on globalized um, movement of, of goods, but also of people. And and, and I wonder if you can shed any light on the, I guess, the bigger global conversation about um, the reality of the climate emergency. Um, you know, I was just quickly reading that, I, I guess, when a person is on a cruise ship, their carbon footprint is three times greater than when they're on land. Um, and of course, the, the cruise industry really, you know, has exploded in the last 15 years. Um, and and I understand that there are you know short medium terms, uh, short medium term um, outcomes that might be beneficial for the port authority as we just talked about in you know post COVID recovery, but I'm also very aware um, of of what that means at a global scale for my children and their future who are you know sometimes when we're chatting at night these days they say. Mummy, pollution's gone down during COVID, right? And they're, you know, they're taking some reassurance from that. So, can you please just, you know, share your thoughts on on how you wrap your head around and how you, as a part of an industry, wrap your head around what the pathway forward is? Captain Gray. Yeah, thank you. Uh, fortunately, at the International Maritime Organization, there's a significant effort to reduce emissions um, across the supply chain. Um, so they're not talking just um, on the ships, but the, across the maritime supply chain, um, because they understand uh, the significance of what they're doing um, from a, a volume. Um, I guess it's 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 one of those difficult ones in the sense of saying that uh, ships, in actual in actual sense, are the most efficient form of transporting um, cargo. Um, in the sense that, you know, on a per tonne basis, their emissions are lower. Um, however, they're significant. 90% of the world trade is carried by ships, so as a volume, they're large. So that's where you're seeing significant work in alternate fuels. So LNG is one of them. Uh, hydrogen is another. So significant work is happening in Japan on hydrogen fuel um, to see if that as a source. Um, but as an interim, I would say that uh, LNG is seen as the most most obvious interim fuel. Um, all ships now are down to the lower sulphur contents. Um, so that happened uh, effective this year. So um, we're, we're seeing that uh, fuels have turned over to lower sulphur content fuels. Um, so that, that there's already a move uh, in that sense. The other is the, the ships are bigger, but they're more efficient. So these large 15,000 to 22,000 vessels are far more efficient um, than the older class vessels that were around. So, um, and whilst they're both commercially efficient for the, the company, they're also far more efficient um, from an emissions point of view. The cruise ships, is, um, they are moving over to LNG as well. There's a number of LNG cru cruise ships coming off uh, on the market now. Um, but understanding that a cruise ship uh, uh, draws a lot of power uh, in the sense of, uh, for example, uh, Vanuatu, which is a Pacific island off Australia uh, that was hit by a cyclone equivalent to your hurricanes, um, a cruise ship was able to go in there and power up the city 
um, by reversing the power output from the cruise ship. So they are a significant power generator and that's why, as you said, with the, the footprint side. Um, but they are moving rapidly across to LNG fuels and, and those alternate fuels to reduce their footprint. Uh, and many of them are moved to the, the, the shore power so that when they're in port, they're reducing the emissions um, import. So the industry's taken a, a very serious look at itself and the IMO is driving that um, through. So as a port, our ability is to incentivise. So if, if we've got players who are doing the right thing or who are going beyond, um, then maybe there's an ability to say, well, we reduce our harbour dues by a percentage to offset the efforts they're making on taking a global stance against emissions. Um, and if they're not, maybe there's a penalty you know, in, involved in that. So that if we can encourage the right operators to operate the right vessels, then we will get a global change in how the industry behaves. Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you, you made reference earlier to uh, a member of the committee. You, you were talking about the efficiency move, movement of cargo um, in the port. And that brings me to the point of um, sa safety of the workforce. Um, I've been told that in, in many employees are suffering from burnout. I don't have evidence of that, so that could be exaggerated. But it has been a comment that uh, I've received in the past. And when the Montreal port was closed, uh, some employees were literally working, according to, to some, day and night, and at least very long shifts. And I realize, I realize now that things are back to the, you know, closer to the norm and the present, although some employees continue to work, uh, you know, long, long hours where sometimes an employee's performance is uh, hindered by fatigue. Um, so, again, Two concerns is uh, one would be the lack of space and more importantly, uh, employee safety. Uh, my understanding that there, there has been accidents uh, uh, during, with the workforce, uh, perhaps maybe uh, sleep fatigue uh, uh, while, while operating equipment and so on uh, at the port. So my question, my first question is what measures have been taken, if any, to make sure uh, em employment or employee safety is paramount while they are performing their uh, working duties? Captain Gray. Thank you. Um, from the perspective of the port, again, it's an influencing position. We don't directly employ the labour, so it's working with our terminals to, to ensure safe operations. So, um, my VP operations um, throughout the COVID event and the Montreal um, disruption um, worked closely with the terminals to ensure that safety was maintained and we were highlighting issues to them. Um, but the expectation is that the terminals um, will implement their safety management plans that have been provided and, and, and effectively manage those. If we get reports, then we will step in and, and, and try and re resolve those from a, from a a port authority point of view. Um, I'm aware that uh, there were long hours uh, when the Montreal event occurred because of the, the volume of cargo that was coming in uh, and that was highlighted to the terminal that we were concerned about the hours of operation and that uh, they needed to manage that um, and they responded accordingly working with Labor to, to try and reduce those hours. Um, but it's... Uh, there's also an unfortunate situation that when in, a, in a year of COVID where um, people's wages were reduced because of hours, um, I guess you, people also saw an opportunity to gain some extra hours. So it was a, a delicate balance um, for the terminal in, in dealing with that, the desire to do extra hours and the risk of fatigue. Um, my expectation is that uh, our stevedores have a fatigue management plan in place and that they're effectively managing that. Um, I have learnt uh, since my arrival in um, Nova Scotia that uh, uh, there's some of these things aren't as advanced as probably what I was used to in Australia, and I'm working with um, various terminals and, and the chief executive officer of the terminals particularly. Um, we both have a passion that uh, safety is paramount, so we're working together that... Uh, we advance safety culture across the waterfront and the port as a whole. Uh, I think maybe perhaps this is the time to take our break and we'll come back for your supplementary after a 15 minute break. So the committee stands recessed for 15 minutes. Thank you. 
please. We'll call the committee back to order and uh, proceed to the supplementary question from uh, Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, perhaps to get the opportunity also, uh, although you've only been here a short time, I've heard some great positive comments about your leadership. So that's, that's great to hear. You mentioned about the volume of uh, cargo at the, at the port. I, um, again, my understanding is I think the Montreal port is a truce or an agreement until March. So if, if that happens to fall apart, Halifax Port may find themselves back to where they were, you know, in uh, yeah, the last couple of months. Um, so I guess my, my question would be, uh, I believe the South End Terminal extension is completed and everything. Um, is there any space left to expand or so where are you with regard to that and, and what sort of difficulties will you uh, encounter if that happens again in Montreal? Captain Gray. Thank you. Um, so I think the thing to understand with Montreal is that it was a 50% surge in volume in a month. Um, so our, our normal systems are built for sort of 10 to 20% surge, and this was a 50% surge. And whilst there was enough land space in real terms, if the cargo was normal cargo, in the sense that it was programmed cargo to flow through the port, uh, this was all import cargo with no export balance to it. So you, you're trying to get empty rail cards to Halifax to take away full containers, whereas our normal flow of cargo is that rail cars arrive here because they're bringing export cargo and they're balanced with the volume of import cargo that's coming. So we get, we get this balance. This created an imbalance. It was just a massive amount of uh, import cargo that landed and the supply chain, unfortunately, took a knee-jerk reaction um, in diverting it all to Halifax. They didn't consider about how they were going to get it out of Halifax and back to Montreal. There was a lot of assumptions in the supply chain that CN or PSA would just miraculously lift the cargo off and take it to Montreal when really it was their role to get it out. Um, so a lot of work was done with the port and PSA and CN to try and find solutions. Um, um, but it was a little bit short-sighted by the, the supply chain. Uh, the other is that when you get this sort of volume increase, normally you've got months of advice to increase labour um, so that you would bring on additional labour and train it and um, you would reposition rail cars and, and that sort of thing. This advice didn't come. It was uh, the Montreal strike's happening. We were waiting to see what, what they were going to do and then suddenly shipping lines said we're going to divert and deliver it in Halifax. So... It put a lot of pressure on the system. What we've done as a learning from this is work with the terminals, both terminals and CN, and work out exactly what can the port handle uh, in the event that there's diverted cargoes and what can we do to better position ourselves for an increase. So we know the exact number of additional ships we can handle. We will go out to the shipping lines and say, if you want to come during a diversion, uh, you will arrive Tuesday and Thursday, um, or, or, don't, or you'll wait. Um, and we've asked them to say if it should occur, you reposition export cargo as well, so that we've got a balancing of, of, of um, rail and that. So there has to be a clear plan in place to remove the cargo going forward. As far as the long-term expansion uh, options, if cargo grows at the volumes that that are currently predicted, then it'll be 10 to 15 years before we need to make a major capital investment for expansion. Um, what is required is optimization of the existing assets um, across the two terminals. So we can delay unnecessary high expense on capital. Um, uh, it should be 10 to 15 years. What would change that would be a cargo shift from New York by one-off customer. So if one shipping line decided to move everything out of New York and say it's going to come through Halifax, that'll give us a step increase that we would have to manage, but and that would bring timelines forward. So um, there's capacity. We can double the current throughput in the port um, as long as we're doing it in a, a growth path where we can gear up labour, gear up rail services. Um, we can easily double the current throughput through the port. Uh, thank you. Just a little time check here, folks. We've got a, we have about 30 minutes left before we go to closing remarks. I've got five on the list. I'm going to try and 
permit supplementaries, and if we, I feel we're running out of time, I'll move to just single questions. Ms. De Costanzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I took advantage of the break and I asked the question, but I will ask it as well again, um, and I won't have any supplementary. The, um, the, while you were talking to my colleague from uh, um, Dartmouth South about connectivity to the park, uh, to Point Pleasant Park, I, uh, it, it um, brought in the, this thought that I have and a dream that I've seen that since 1984 when I emigrated, there was no downtown waterfront. There was so little. Uh, and there was no Bedford waterfront. And I, the amount of uh, pleasure and community and people flocking to those both areas is incredible what it's done. And for me, it's just common sense that we should connect the two, find ways of connecting the two as we're developing all these apartment buildings and increase the, the uh, population, we need that vent. And, it, and the biggest example is the uh, Bedford Basin Market and the new, um, uh, uh, oh, there's a, a beer garden right on the waterfront, lineups. Just, it is such a, a popular thing because people love to be by the waterfront and the waterfront should be for the, for the community. Is there any way that the port and maybe other larger businesses will work towards giving the waterfront back to the communities? Captain Gray. Yeah, thank you. And as indicated earlier, we work with um, Develop Nova Scotia in what their projects are and see where there's compatibility across those projects. And the establishment of the Collaborative Transport Forum and the Collaborative Decision Making Platform allow us to work with both HRM and the provincial governments to look at the long-term planning and see whether there's things we can do together that um, would create a long-term sustainable solution. And that could be um, what do we do with lands that are unused, what do, what do we do with building areas, uh, can we create connectivity when we're doing a project? Um, for example, um, with the rail solution, you know, there was a safety issue, but could we turn fixing a safety issue of rail, um, rail coming through, increased rail, could we do something that was innovative to create a connectivity for the city? So our plan is to be, uh, as I said, one port city, uh, not the port in isolation to the city. Uh, and our aim is to continue with collaboration with all parts, both industry and um, the government sectors to, in, in all ways, look for a sustainable type solution in everything we do. So not just, here's, here's a fix to today's problem, let's have a look at today's problem and see are there other things that we can do to facilitate future improvements. And uh, uh, that the, um, Point Pleasant Park's one, uh, the Africville area is another, um, but even down here in the waterfront, um, we're looking at that and Dartmouth. So, uh, as I indicated, we recently uh, established the Port Community Liaison Committee. Uh, one member of that community uh, is from the Dartmouth region, and uh, she actually asked the question in the in in the first meeting and said, "Why am I here? The port doesn't have any land over in Dartmouth, so why would you want me on the committee?" And we said. If we're going to be a true port city, um, we need to be considering all parts of the city, not just downtown where we're operating. Uh, and whilst we're not there today, maybe there's strategies or things that we're doing which could improve socioeconomic um, growth or business development in Dartmouth if we were to take that into account. If we ignored it and just said, well, we'll just keep doing everything on the Halifax side, then we may be missing obvious opportunities um, for for sustainable development in the future. So it's, and the other thing is, you know, um, our partners like CN operate through Dartmouth. So if there's issues, we have the ability to talk to our partners and see if we can influence improvement and, and that sort of thing. So by opening up to a poor community group that gives us a broader diverse insight, then we have much more opportunity to get um, more collaborative solutions going forward. Mr. McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to uh, touch on uh, some of the conversations around the environmental impact and the globalization um, and the impact that uh, uh, the, the ports have on bringing goods and services here to not just to Nova Scotia, but right across North America. Um, I, I remember reading about something a while back, and I wonder if this would have any impact on um, 
not only the carbon footprint of these boats, but also would it have any impact on our <coughs> port in particular. And it was a debate around uh, the Panama Canal versus the North, is it the Northwest Passage. Um, would that have any impact on uh, us here in Halifax, in, in particular, like cargo coming from uh, the Asian markets? Um, I do know, like, the, the research and, and what I read about it was um, going up through the Northwest uh, Passage uh, cut down uh, the time and the carbon footprint of these boats significantly rather than going through the Panama Canal. Like, so is that something that's still being discussed or is that something that, like, are you talking to um, the, the freight line owners in the, in the, uh, the different ports around the world? Captain Gray. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm aware of the discussions and I know most of the shipping lines have backed away from the Northwest Passage um, on the basis of environmental impacts outside of carbon footprint. So um, CMA CGM was one that said they would, wouldn't do it um, even though it is a shorter passage. Um, they said the other or environmental risks as far as they were concerned outweighed um, the emissions footprint and they then pursued um, what fuels they could do and what they could do with their engines to improve their overall global footprint. So um, the, the advantage of the larger vessels is that the, the long haul services like Panama or through sewers are more efficient than they used to be. So uh, moving 20,000 boxes uh, through these paths or 15,000 through Panama um, are far more efficient than they used to be. So. Uh, I believe that they're, they're comfortable with that. And there was certainly a rush at the start um, for an opportunity, but I think when they balanced everything out, um, their preference was to, to stay with the routes they've got. Mrs. Mr. McGuire, a supplementary. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, just doing a quick uh, little research on the amount of uh, uh, vessels and cargo that's coming through, and this isn't including uh, cruise ships and, and passengers, but coming through our port um, on the uh, Port of Halifax's uh, Wikipedia site, uh, said uh, 1,500 vessels, um, 546, 691 uh, containers, uh, cargo coming, the containers coming through, and uh, that, that breaks down to about uh, 15,000 um, for the most part, well-paying jobs uh, that that you're able to support a family and, and plus plus plus. Um, are we anywhere near capacity at the Halifax port? Uh, what would we need to do uh, if we are? What needs to be done to expand that capacity? If we're not, what do we need to do? Because you know those jobs are pretty covenant. You know, I I, I would say probably about a third of those people work in my community and live in my, or sorry, live in my community. And, and you know, as for Mr. Dunn's question about hours and stuff like that, the one good thing about the jobs down at the port, um, there is no set time. Uh, you know, it, you don't have to work an 18 hour shift if you don't want to. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of the individuals that are going down there are working the hours that they want to work the days they want, especially once you get off the cardboard into the union. So I guess my question, um, sorry, it was kind of a long ramble there, but are we near full capacity of what we can bring into the port? If so, what needs to be done to expand that? And if not, how do we get more? Captain Gray. Okay, um, at the moment, we're at about 50% of the total capacity that the port can handle. Um, Having said that, there's there's need, as volumes grow, they'll need to optimise their space and they'll need to ramp up labour and and increase the number of trains that are, are, are pulling cargo away, given that 60% of our cargo is pulled away by trains. So, um, so there's optimisation that's needed in the, in the first component of it, um, but we could easily exceed a million TEUs um, in the port here. Um, the next stage of expansion um, would, would be about 10 to 15 years away. If growth were to continue pre-COVID, um, then it would be about 10 to 15 years away before we would need that additional capacity. Uh, that's been identified. Um, a lot of work was done before I came here on looking at alternatives and the northern expansion was considered to be the, the best of the solutions. Um, I've reviewed that since I came here to make sure from an op operational lens, which I come from, um, that that was the, the correct solution. 
uh, and I've had that verified that that would be the correct expansion and PSA is supportive of, of that position as well. Uh, so w that's where we would see the next phase of the expansion moving to the north. That would take us another 10 years further into the future at least. Um, we have in our master plan uh, developed the expansion plans to take us 50 years into the future. So Halifax can, um, with a growth rate of 3.6 to 4 per cent year on year, um, we have enough capacity in expansion plans to take us through 50 plus years. So. Ms. Roberts. Thank you. I'm here trying to figure out how to get three questions into two. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm going to go back a little bit to uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, related uh, to to the port activities, but also uh, to the the global shipping and and cruise industry. Um, that, of course, the port is is. Um, a part of, and I, I wonder if you can speak to me uh, just generally about where greenhouse gas emission, um, where those live, like where they get assigned to. Um, clearly, from from you know your report, you're you're tracking again the on land component, but uh, you mentioned a number of times uh, LNG. Uh, which is seen as like the pathway forward for um, for the cruise industry and also for the global shipping industry. Here in Nova Scotia, we have the possibility of a new export terminal, which um, I understand if it if it goes ahead will actually um, cause us to exceed by about a third um, our uh, provincial greenhouse gas emission target. So. Um, yeah, that, like where where does this stuff live um, in terms of uh, where the emissions where the emissions are are tracked and tabulated? Captain Gray, uh, I think it will be in general terms because it varies from place to place. Um, I know that uh, ports that are trying to take a more holistic view, which um, we're trying to do, um, take the carbon footprint of the port of the ships that are within our environment within the port limits into our account um, however um, we don't take the, the the emissions beyond that into our tabulation but they are being taken into account at an IMO level um, one of the things that's occurring at the moment uh, through IMO and some work between the ports is what they call just-in-time arrivals so that we can reduce the emissions of ships turning up at the port by preventing anchoring um, and that's not so much that whilst they're anchoring they're creating emissions it's the fact that if they go at full steam or full speed to get to the port only to anchor it's a false economy on on emission emissions and fuel usage so um, some of the digitalization path is actually looking at how do they make sure that they understand when they would be required in the port and and get there so so it's expanding beyond the port to, to start to look globally because then now as you start to put one port in touch with the next port and a vessel leaves that port and you know when it's arriving at the next one and you can set its speed at a lower speed, you're starting to take a global perspective on, on emissions. Um, one of the things we said here, um, we know that the HRM have released uh, a 2050 uh, emissions plan um, but it, that hadn't taken into account the, the port's emissions and impact. Um, so we've said we need to, to collaborate more together to understand the port's impact on those because, again, it's no good if just the, the city's taking action and the port hasn't taken um, equivalent action in trying to reduce their emissions. So um, at this stage, at a general point of view, it's, it's caught of all over the place in, in many places around the world. Um, our aim here is to try and bring it together as a holistic calculation. Um, so the port's activities directly impact on the, um, the city and the city's actions directly impact on the port so that we can work together. Mr Hayes? I can't uh, comment on the, the specifics of your question, but you mentioned crews and the growth of crews. And, um, Back in 1987, I joined an organization called the Marine Hotel Association. I was selling to the cruise lines. 
and at the time the global passenger count for cruise was 4 million and the stretch goal of the industry to was re to reach 8 million passengers a year. Um, in 2019, I attended the Sea Trade Conference in Miami where all of the cruise lines and the ports around the world congregate on an annual basis to talk about the state of the industry, and this is pre-pandemic, of course. And the, uh, the annual passenger count exceeded 30 million, and in their view, the, the sky was the limit. Um, I think over 90 new, new builds are under construction around the world. Uh, something like 60, 70 billion dollars of capital going into that industry, and uh, it's hard to know what you know the pandemic will do to that industry longer term. But the the growth is is very significant, and as Alan referenced earlier, there's a lot of technology improvements in uh, propulsion systems and so on. But I was uh, taken by your comment about what your kids said about uh, you know some of the benefits of uh, in terms of lack of pollution so it's a you know it's a global issue for sure Ms. Roberts thank you I appreciate those answers this is where if you pay close attention you'll you'll see two questions in one um, so what analysis uh, does the Port Authority do around the impact of climate change and rising sea levels on port infrastructure? Um, and, and, you know, what does, what does that look like? What does that planning look like? And, and um, the federal government has committed to sourcing 100% renewable energy for all of its buildings by 2025. I'm not sure if that commitment covers Crown Corporations as well, and if that might be part of your planning. Captain Gray? I might take the second question, snuck in there first. Um, it's not been identified in our, um, that that funding is for us, so, um, um, but we're looking at that sort of thing ourselves in our sustainability planning um, and how to reduce our footprint, so, but it hasn't been, we, the ports haven't been identified in that fund, federal plan, funding. Uh, I say primarily because under the Act we're required to be financially um, sustainable and independent, um, so that's probably why. Um, from the point of um, coming back to the first question, which was around uh, yeah, you can <laughs> the rising, rising sea level. Sorry, thank you. Um, the so all our port design and uh, and new works, new projects. Um, take in rising sea level and infrastructure resilience. So uh, as part of the, it used to be in the old days, safety by design, now it's um, resilience in design. Um, so we, we look at um, dealing with increased storminess and impacts from that and rising sea levels. So um, that's taken into the new design. And we continue to assess our current infrastructure to look at its resilience with increased storminess and, and, and that as we go forward. Um, currently, it's not a threat in the near future. Um, as we uh, look at the northern expansion, we'll be looking at um, lifting the level of that new area um, so that it's built for future areas and we would look to have to come back to the old area into the future. Um, uh, probably working with our partners is looking at the complete supply chain and as you're aware, that you know, we're critical on, on rail. So making sure rail can continue to be able to access um, our ports will be important going forward into the future. So um, Connect Eastmas um, would have a big play in that for us. So. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jessen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll go back to the <laughs> subject of labour. Uh, is there any recognize gaps in talent related to, I guess, the, the local workforce that the Port Authority has identified and how, through the chair, how would you seek to, to overcome that challenge uh, on a, in, a, in a local way? Captain Gray. Yeah, I think, I think the biggest challenge, um, um, particularly in a workforce like like the waterfront is the some would say the opportunity for automation others would say the threat of threat of automation going forward um, so um, 
there's generally a, a pushback in many of the waterfront environments, and I'm not saying just Halifax, to say when you start talking automation that that's loss of jobs. Um, it's repositioning jobs. Um, from my experience uh, in what I've seen in Australia in the automation there, um, they retrain people and they took on different jobs. I think the opportunity uh, is is looking at the future, so not automation tomorrow, but eventually automation would, would, would come into the industry as volumes increase. And how do we set up training programs for the young people coming through today so that they're well positioned to take on automation when it comes? So rather than saying we take our established workforce now and retrain them for this gap, we look at how do we transition across I think that would be well received. I mean, if you think of the tradition of the waterfront, it's about getting their sons and daughters um, to follow them in the footprint. And, and some of them are probably looking at their future careers and all the technology and innovation out there and go, well, where does Steve Adoring fit into that for me? Uh, I think if you can sell a path that shows they have a position and they have an opportunity in automation to ROV and planning and those sorts of things. There's a whole new career path in the waterfront for them. Um, but I think it's a, a slow change management transition and developing the skill sets now with the training establishments we have here. Uh, and, and PSA as a global partner is probably a great partner to be able to facilitate local colleges in developing training packages. Mr. Jessam, do you have a supplementary? Uh, yeah, just a, maybe a little bit of a deeper dive into where you started going uh, related to, I guess, partnerships with perhaps local institutions. I mean, we talked a little bit about the incubator relationship with Cove, but uh, separately perhaps you could speak to any relationships you might have with our uh, university institutions or the Nova Scotia Community College through the chair. Cap Captain Gray. My apologies. Um, one of the things is that I've outreached to all of the universities and um, uh, colleges, so NSCC, um, to look at what are the opportunities that we can have partnering together. Um, for myself, it's getting access to graduates. Um, and an example of that is uh, we took on a greater planning role, knowing that we've got our master plan to work at. And I could have done it by just putting, going out and buying a contractor or a consultant, you know. Um, but instead, we've brought in three graduates from the university in different fields. So we've given them two years to help work with the master plan, and then we'll rotate those out and, and get different fields as we go into different stages of planning. Uh, they're supplemented by co-ops, so the three to four month students from the NSCC. So the, the planning department has three permanent staff but has quite a fluid um, graduate and co-op um, group. So the, the advantage for us in that is, again, talent identification, but it's the ability of bringing fresh ideas into the planning process. Um, and we try to give them four years worth of experience in two so that they can go out into the industry and, and, and be sellable. Ultimately, we'll, we aim to get them back later in their careers with a bit more experience under their belt. Um, but So that's primarily. The other is uh, working on programs to educate year nines uh, on the potential opportunities and careers that exist in the maritime sector as a whole. So. Um, I've been working uh, with uh, a member of the Cove group. Um, in fact, I wrote a couple of passages for her book on, on the blue economy, but it's working with them to highlight for Year 9 students what are the opportunities in the blue economy. Um, but also, a lot of teachers out there are unfamiliar on how to uh, apply what they're teaching in the science maths field. So the port's a great living lab, as I say, that allows teachers to see how things can be applied. And I, d I did a lot of work in uh, Fremantle working with teachers, teaching them opportunities to apply into the port environment um, what they're teaching in maths and science. And we've been talking to um, some of the institutions about how can we develop similar programs here. So. We'll move now to um, Mr. Rushton. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you guys uh, very much for what you're doing, not, not just in the HRM area that you have an impact, but uh, I think locally are the products that come from my area, wood fibre, blueberries, 
that uh, wouldn't see a market without, uh, without the port. So it's very important to our economy in the province, and Atlantic Canada, and Canada for that matter, that the port doesn't just uh, succeed, that they excel. And uh, with the expansion, and, and I'm looking at numbers, by 2030, you expect to see 800,000 TEU. Um, that's a pretty, uh, pretty good target. And, and you've laid out the groundwork where, where you certainly can achieve it. But I, I guess my question is, is there, there's been some down, downward trends in, in uh, throughput, throughput uh, through the port. And if, if we're led to believe the, what the Premier said, that our economy is doing so strong in Nova Scotia, can you explain why, why the downward trend on something that's so important to our economy? And what role has the government played to make sure or ensure that the port succeeds that target for 2030? Captain Gray. Yeah, as indicated, the key for the port is to give opportunity. Um, so we, we don't um, directly create trades that can go in and out. Um, so the idea is to, um, to make sure that we have enough capacity to ma match the demand or exceed the demand that um, is, is going to be put on it and to make sure that we have the services available that allow export and import markets to, to do what they have to do. From there, it's about um, what's the opportunity for markets to grow here. So, um, and that will stipulate how we grow. Um, there's a portion of our growth which is directly related to growth in, the, in, in new GDP and, and population. So as population grows, we'll get a larger demand um, on our, our import services and export. Um, the other component of it is, is what we draw in from the Midwest and the manufacturing areas. So, uh, from a response of what can the government do, it's, a, it's about, you know, facilitating uh, export markets, you know, um, reaching out to other, the, the places where we've opened up a service to, it's talking to those markets and facilitating trade operation, you know, trade agreements between that so that the markets can open up. Um, we've got the service there available, it's ensuring that the, the two places can trade with each other. And then um, it's promoting um, homegrown um, opportunities. Uh, so, Mr. Russian, we do have time for your supplementary. You'll have the final question. I'll just make this quick. And, and, and with the growth of that, I, I would expect that our Nova Scotia's natural resources would take part in that. And as I said, very important in my area, blueberries, forestry. And you, you mentioned uh, earlier that you, you were in talks with, uh, with, with maybe India, if I remember correctly. Um, were, the, were those talks with India, were they in, in collaboration with the government forestry sector or the private forestry sector? Maybe you can't answer the next question, but what kind of items would we be looking at shipping? There, there's, there's a lot of people seeking hope in the forestry sector right now with a lot of silence that's been bared out. So just looking for a little hope for them, maybe. Captain Gray. For clarification, uh, we're not talking directly to India. We're talking to shipping lines that provide a service via India. So a lot of our services are direct Asia calls, so Southeast Asia. Um, but a couple of the shipping lines actually do calls through India. So the opportunity is to see if we can shift that service away from a New York or somewhere like that into Halifax. And then that would give us a direct service to an India market. Um, so it's, it's less about what the trade was, but opening up an opportunity. Um, when we do that, then we can talk to our uh, customers and say, look, we've opened up an additional opportunity here. Um, this might be a market you want to talk to. We do hear occasionally you know, of potential opportunities and we pass those through to our customers um, if, they, if they come through us, through our business development guys. Did you want to add something, Mr Hayes? Yeah, if I could, I just wanted to add in relationship to what the provincial government can do, even though we are a, a federal agency, um, in a, a number of trade missions to China, for example, the business development folks at HBA coordinated with the Premier's trade missions and participated in those, uh, which is helpful when you go to a, a country like China. Uh, NSBI has been involved in a number of marketing efforts as well to support uh, trade at, at HBA. Great, thank you. Well, that concludes our questions. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all the members for their concise questions and the witnesses today for your concise uh, responses. We got quite uh, a lot of things covered. Uh, so I'll now turn it over to Mr. Hayes for closing remarks. Uh, thank you. Uh, I've been on the board of HPA for six years, and I don't think uh, I, I can remember a, an invitation to this committee. 
Um, I think uh, I'm delighted that uh, we've had the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, the port is such a, uh, an economic generator within uh, not only the, the uh, HRM but throughout the province and the region. And um, as I said earlier, even though we are, a, a, I guess, the Government of Canada is our shareholder, we view the province as a, a very important stakeholder in what goes on at the port. So we would be uh, delighted to be invited back at any time as long as Alan answers 95% of the questions, as he did today. <laughs> and I think, I think you can appreciate uh, how happy we are that he's, uh, he's taken on the role of CEO and uh, we look forward to um, you know, years of success under his leadership. Thank you. Captain Cray, did you want to add anything? Uh, thank you. Um, just in closing, I mean, as the President and CEO, my role is to bring all the port partners together <laughs> and find a balance. And, uh, and my platform when I arrived here, as I said, was one port city, and I set out straight away to seek collaboration and not consultation. Uh, the difference is consulting tends to just says, this is what we're doing and we're letting you know. Collaboration is about seeking an opportunity to uh, understand what the issues are from both sides and see if we can find a balance in that solution. Um, I'm committed and my team is committed to providing a sustainable port into the future. And as I said, we set up the Port Community Liaison Committee and I specifically, although I never got to pick any of the members the independent chair did, I said, I want somebody who's in their early 20s on the, on, or younger on the committee. And they said, why is that? And I said, because I won't be here in 50 years' time when the port's still operating. So I want to hear the insight of somebody that young who will be around and has to live with the way the port's functioning in the future. So we are, we're committed to making sure that the port going forward provides the economic development, which is so important to uh, Nova Scotia and Canada, but ultimately does that in a sustainable way that supports community and supports a safe environment as we go forward. And uh, my mandate is to achieve all of that and balance all of that as I go forward. So not an easy challenge, but... Uh, that, that's what my path is. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> well, thank you both. Thank you uh, uh, for all of, of your work, for responding to the questions here today. Uh, we've learned a lot about uh, this very important uh, asset. Uh, really, Halifax was built on that harbour, and it continues to play a huge uh, part in our economic future. So we thank you, and thank you both for your leadership over the last particularly challenging year with the ups and downs of... COVID and Northern Pulp and Montreal. Um, so thank you. And uh, you can uh, now leave. Well, the committee is going to move on to a few minutes of business, and uh, there may be some press out there would be, that would be interested in speaking with you. But thanks again for coming. Okay, folks. Uh, committee business. We've got, we've got a few items here on the agenda to kind of clean up here. Um, uh, at the September 29th meeting, the committee discussed its 2020 annual report, which had been circulated to members earlier in the month. It appeared to meet with general approval without comment, but the wording of the motion to pass was incorrect. Uh, the committee approved the correspondence instead of the annual report. So uh, just to get the committee's explicit approval uh, on the record, I'd ask someone to make a motion that this committee accept its 2020 annual report and table it in the House of Assembly. Mr. Jessam? So moved as read by the chair. Thank you. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Motion is carried, thank you. Uh, with respect to some correspondence uh, from uh, emails from uh, member Rushton, um, in reading aloud the committee correspondence Admitted at the September 29th meeting, the chair omitted a sentence acknowledging receipt of two emails from committee member Tory Rushton, MLA, in response to the June 2nd letter from the NDP members. Mr. Rushton also asked the chair to reconvene the committee. We would all like that noted for the official record. As well, uh, with respect to a document, uh, a letter tabled on September 29th, in our last meeting, member Tory, Tory Rushton, MLA, read aloud sections of a letter to the Premier from Forest, Nova Scotia. Since we're not distributing paper documents uh, in our meetings as a precaution against COVID-19, Mr. Rushton properly tabled the document 
by emailing it to the committee clerk after the meeting. It's available for members and the public on request uh, from the clerk. With respect to new business, um, the November 24th meeting time, the, uh, we're asking the committee if we can move the meeting by an hour uh, from one o'clock to start at 2 p.m. on November 24th as the witness is not available to that hour. Is that uh, acceptable to all members? It's agreed. All right, thank you. Uh, and then just looking ahead to our December meeting, that falls on December 22nd. Uh, would committee members wish to meet earlier in the month, um, perhaps a date of uh, Tuesday, December 15th from 10 to 12? Mr. McGuire. So back to the previous, uh, the previous question, is it possible to have it earlier because some of us have to deal with childcare? So moving it an hour ahead uh, deals with our children coming out of school, right? Well, I, I believe if the committee, if the witness can't meet from one, they are not available from one to two. But is it possible to do it in the morning or to reschedule or? Uh, the clerk, do you have any information that would shed any different light on? Is it on possible to reach out to them to find out if they can, if we can reschedule for a morning session, if the committee agrees, just because I can ask them. Um, if they say a morning meeting isn't possible, then how does the committee want me to proceed? Okay. Uh, are members of the committee uh, generally available at any time during that day? So shall we s ask if we can meet at 10 o'clock? And if the witnesses are not available... I just think then the backup would be at, uh, at 2 o'clock. Uh, Mr. McGuire? I just think that what we should be doing is, you know, uh, just taking into consideration when some of these requests come forward that some of us do have children and it's difficult. Uh, children, they're out of school at 2.15, 2.30, and a lot of us do have to go and pick up our children. And, and uh, so... All right, I'll ask the clerk to take that under yeah. advisement when dealing with, with these issues. Ms. DiCostanzo. So, uh, the... Today we had two committee meetings, so I'm wondering if the 24th we would have HR as well in the morning. Uh, the clerk? Good question. But as it turns out, that's the month that HR is meeting on Thursday the 26th because of witness availability, so that morning is open. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so uh, we clarified we're going to try for 10, and if not, uh, two will be the backup. And then to uh, the December... 22nd, are people comfortable moving that to December 15th from 10 to 12? That will be followed by Veterans Affairs 2 to, 2 to 4 on that 15th. It's acceptable to move it to the 15th at 10 a.m. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'd like to uh, thank our clerk, uh, Judy Cavanaugh, and Sherry Mitchell, who have supported us, as well as Gordon Hebbar. Wedge Council. Uh, so the next meeting will be November uh, 24th uh, at either 10 or 2 p.m. With that, the meeting. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The meeting is adjourned. Yes, we do. You you have a point, Mr. Mr. Rushton. Uh, thank you. Uh, just more of a question um, for 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 procedure. I, I did not want to bring this up during during the uh, process while well, our guests were here. Anytime I've sat in this committee, Mr. Chair, we, we've always recognized opposition first and then shared the questions one, two, three to uh, PC, Liberal, NDP. Um, just looking for next meeting to have clarification. Our, our caucus staffs and all the caucus regulate the questions on, on what was perceived the, the previous meeting. So just looking for clarification for that for the next meeting. Uh, right, well, we can make a decision on, on that if you'd like. The, uh, the Community Services Committee, which I chair, uh, I, has been run the way I ran the meeting here today. Uh, I feel it's the most equitable way in which we get a chance to hear from all members. So uh, that's the way that I have chosen uh, to chair these committees. Uh, and we've done that with community services. If this committee wants to operate in a different way, uh, we can do that. Mr. McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm open for anything, but I will say that uh, for the most part, uh, I, I chair a few committees and I do the same thing. Uh, I think as long as everybody has the time uh, to get those questions in, um, 
I don't, I don't, I don't see an issue with it. But uh, it does, you know, I, I don't, I don't see how having um, an like having the Conservatives go first makes a big difference. I mean, maybe it does to them. Uh, but in my path, and you know, I did one this morning, and and the member from Dartmouth South, uh, or South, Dartmouth South went first. Uh, and uh, we didn't have any complaints from the, the Conservative Party, and I don't think it actually impacted their questions or the answers. So I, I just guess if there is this just about we're the official opposition, so we have the we have the you know it's our uh, right to go first, or it's our you know we're entitled to go first, um, or is this about is is there something that we're missing here, Ms. Ginger? I'm hesitant to weigh in, but I will say that uh, having served on most legislative committees, except for community services, um, uh, chairs do it differently, but I do appreciate when the question rotation goes by caucus. It doesn't really bother me who goes first, but I do think giving caucuses equal time versus members equal time seems to be to be more equitable where we have a majority of liberals on every legislative committee who have access to information that the opposition doesn't particularly at this moment. It is poignant in a time when we haven't been in the legislature for many, 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 many months. Um, it, it just feels to me like that is the most equitable arrangement. I don't care who goes first. If we people run out of questions and other members have questions, that's great. But I think in the committees where we go by caucus in rounds, um, I just find that to be an equitable arrangement. Mr. Rushton? Yeah, to the point about us going first, it has nothing to do with us going first. The question was for clarification. I, I, I've, I've only been in this legislature for a short time, and, and uh, you're, my member opposite is quite right. We've only been here a very short time this, this year, um, 13 days to be precise, and, and it's been quite a long time since. It was about clarification. Every meeting I've been to this committee, it was PC, Liberal, NDP. I could care less who goes first. It wasn't about who goes first. We have a new researcher here. The researcher, as, as like every other caucus, looked at the previous meetings. They planned, and if we could just get a concise decision, that's what I was looking for. But I do agree. If, if it goes by caucus, then we, we all have a fair, fair voice at the table per caucus. Mr. Dunn. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, uh, I've been around committees also for quite some time, um, and I wasn't sure if it was an agreement or, uh, or I was assuming that uh, in these committees that uh, when the question part of the committee would start, it would automatically go to the PCs and then to the NDP and then over to the government. Again, uh, that has been my experience for at least 10 years, but uh, we can clarify that, yes. Mr. McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would just compare it to, uh, and this will be my last comment on it, but I'll, I mean, it, the members are talking about fairness, and, and at the, the, uh, the committee that I chair today, in, in actual fact, uh, the members of the opposition received more time and more questions than the government. Um, and I didn't hear or see any complaints from the government side about that. In fact, I know that uh, the member from Hammonds Plains actually was waiting for to ask a question in today's meeting, but never never uh, got to ask that question because the member of uh, the Conservative Party, uh, when told that they could only take a minute, took four minutes uh, instead. So I would say, listen, it's in a, let's just move this along. Uh, if they feel they're entitled to go first, I don't think anyone really has a big issue with the Conservatives uh, wanting to go first. If it really disrupts their flow of questions and things like that, um, I'd just say we put it to a vote and have at her. Yeah. Mr. Jessup. In fairness to chairs across the across government, I mean there there is an element of the chair's own discretion to have a meeting flow as he or she sees fit. There are other committees that have made a a structural decision around question flow. I know I've been a chair of a couple of different committees, and I've been asked to do it different ways. Like, I mean, t to me, it is a little bit. Um, difficult to try and get, you know, questions in 
as a as a government member who wants to ask questions about my constituency the same as everybody else would expect to to be able to do so and having um multiple members trying to fit into that window of time makes things difficult but i i would i would just defer to the chair mr rushton just clarification it wasn't point of order it was just a point of clarification this is only two committees that i've ever sat on in the short term I've seen it go the way that it's gone ever since I've sat in this committee. I just asked for a point of clarification. It wasn't a combat of who's going first, who's going second. We, we can save that for the school ground. But uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, I leave it to the chair. But we, we just wanted clarification so new people coming in can understand how the committee's going to, meeting's going to flow. It's not going to change meeting to meeting. Right. Okay. Well, I uh, appreciate those comments. I, I think we will... Uh, uh, proceed uh, as we did today. I thought it was fair and equitable. It moved uh, around the room, and I think everybody uh, got an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, I think to Mr. McGuire's point uh, this morning, there was one liberal question uh, for the whole day, and I think we are all elected officials representing our communities. We all should be full participants in the meeting. Um, and I think we want to have a further discussion and bring consistency across all of the committees that that might be uh, a discussion for the Management uh, Affairs Committee to, to talk about. But uh, I think uh, in all the meetings that I have chaired, I've run it this way. It has worked well, and this is... Uh, 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 so I think what I'm here is we'll proceed this way and... Uh, if, uh, if there's disagreement, then bring it up with Management Affairs and we can see if we can have consistency across, the, uh, across uh, all the committees. Ms. Gender. Well, just a point of clarification. My, when, when we attempt to discuss issues surrounding committees with the speaker uh, and with that committee, aside from changing the rules, committees are in fact their own creature. So this is probably accounts for some of the differences we see across committees. I'm fine to, to continue, so I'm not making another substantive comment, but I just want to say that that may not in fact be the right place for that and we should determine here. And I think it's your prerogative as chair, you know, to we can continue or we could bring it up in the future as an agenda item, but I don't think that we'd get very far in that venue, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Final word to Ms. De Costanzo. I believe my colleague, all he wanted is at the beginning of the meeting to say how we're going to run the meeting so that he knows to put his hand up. That's all. That's, that's where he was going, I believe. All right, fair enough. Thank, thank you. you. All right, I think that covers everything. Thank you. The meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>